Sue Eifholzer, and I've been working with New for several years. And uh, we're here tonight to learn about the petition that the Onondaga filed with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights of the Organization of American States. They filed that on April 15th. And so we uh, brought several speakers here to uh, help you learn and understand this better. Um, Frida is going to speak to us, and Sid uh, Tadadajo, Sid Hill. If you guys would come up here, we would appreciate it. Let's get the lawyer. <laughs> we were going to put it And Joe, the Onondaga lawyer, Joe. <laughs> The word is that Orrin might show up at some point, so we'll wait and see what happens. But we'd, we'd like to have uh, Sid speak a little bit first about, um, you know, why they filed the petition, what, that all, what it means to them, and that, but then perhaps if he wants to say something about when they were in D.C. Uh, demonstrating that day also. So I will pass this to you, Sid. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, well, it goes back, uh, uh, I have to I like to go back to uh, when uh, this coffee went to, to the uh, uh, League of Nations back in the early, early 1920s, around there, where our people started looking at that time. Uh, he, was a, he was one of the leaders of the Haudenosaunee and went there to, to uh, complain about how, how Canada was, was treated people up there and so and of course uh, he was denied to speak there and there was a lot of things going back on and back then uh, they were doing the Re reorganization act and uh, tried, uh, around the same time that they tried to uh, uh, declare us citizens you know of, of the US so it's all this uh, a lot of things were going on back then uh, and then but and then again, jump up to uh, 19, around 1977 is when our, a group of leaders went to the U uh, Geneva uh, and uh, went back there. So they were, they were kind of setting a path to, uh, to some of the, uh, uh, some of the things that were happening. And this was a group that all around, uh, from North and South America that went there and, uh, to, uh, to make sure that people knew that we were still here and we still have problems here. Uh, but I, so I think, I think back then our leaders thought that, you know, even though I think uh, in 77, just, just around then, we were, they were just allowed to uh, go back into the courts uh, with, the, with the Oneida, with the Oneida claims. And, uh, so I think they were kind of setting a path that they knew uh, it wasn't, we weren't going to get a fair shake or, or whatever. We, you know, we never thought we wouldn't get into court. Uh, I guess we got in our little bit only to be denied uh, access to that or not to hear us or just being dismissed like it was. So I think they knew back in, in the back of their minds that, uh, that something like this would happen. So now we've, we, so we do have, uh, we have been working with the, uh, the UN uh, uh, the, after some 30, 40 years. Uh, our leader's been down there and with, the, with other indigenous people around the world uh, finally got accepted the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. So that goes worldwide. So there's always, always been these issues uh, for, for us, for uh, indigenous people here in uh, North America and around the world. So it's, it's always, uh, I guess it's uh, things, you have to look back in history, okay, things happen, you know, those things happen and, and you think you're coming back into now at this time, of, uh, at this time, that there would be a place where we could, where we could uh, say, you know, bring our grievances and, and, and open to a, a, an open court that would accept that and say, well, okay, yes, we understand this, this happened back then, but what do we do now? Not, oh, it just happened 
way back then, and it's not happening now. Well, not to us now directly, but the, the courts, the courts are doing the same thing. Okay, we're not, we're not having wars. We're not, uh, we don't have the boarding schools. We don't have displacement, relocation. Uh, we don't have that these days. But we thought, well, we go into court, and this is where we can be heard. And so for that to be dismissed at this time, when you think everything is, uh, we've gone past those days, and, and it seems uh, it's, it's a different uh, kind of a, a feeling when we have, uh, we have racial issues, you've gone through the civil rights and, and uh, women's suffrage, and, you know, and we're still, still debating whether, whether Ritzkins is acceptable or not. Where, where are we? You know, where, where is it? Uh, we don't understand where it's where it's acceptable to, for this for this as an ethnic group to to be uh, treated this way. So, so we still have questions. Well, we still, even though we don't have <coughs> access to the courts for, for our land rights, uh, so then we just go on. You know, we don't just give up and say, okay, uh, I'm a U.S. citizen now, or I'm a Canadian citizen. Uh, no, that's not what that's not what our elders and our all the all the struggles and the, and, and the sacrifice they had. That's not what they set for our passport. It said continue on, continue on until you have these, that you are respected and have these rights, and uh, you, 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 will, you will be heard. So I think that's that's pretty much a, a quick history of, of how we feel and uh, what's happened up to now, and now we're going into that into this new arena of uh, international uh, with the OAS starting there and there's still other UN uh, avenues to pursue. So, so we just, we're just kind of beginning to in, uh, get into uh, just, just a new arena. Thank you. Thanks, Sid. Um, it's always good to be reminded of that long history that you've gone through. Uh, next, we'd like to ask Grandmother Frida Jacques to say a few words about she's thinking about this. Well, for a very long time, you know, we've gone through a lot and we lost access to a lot of our land and our, the areas that we were accustomed to going to for our medicines and for fishing, you know, there just aren't fish in our creeks that we can fish for anymore, and the water is very dirty, and people really miss uh, being able to use those waters for recreation, and um, that was all part of our land rights action, um, asking that things be cleaned up. Um, and. Um, what Sid helped me, brought me to, was how the doctrine of discovery has affected us all. And people think of it as ancient stuff, and it really isn't, because in 2005, the Oneidas, when they took their, um, their, went to court, they were taken to court by, what's the name of the town? Cheryl. Cheryl. They were taken to court by Cheryl. Uh, the decision on the Supreme Court uh, had that referenced as one of the, the first reference, and it was in 2005, the Doctrine of Discovery. And when we were in Albany about our land rights action, oh, how many years ago was that? About five years ago? Seven years ago? Anyway, we were in Albany um, with our land rights action, and the state uh, judge was there. He started listening to us, and he was saying things like, oh, they just want justice. The actual judge was saying this, and we were rather inspired at the moment. And we had a nice full house there. Lots of our friends from uh, Neighbors of Onondaga Nation were there. And I thought it was going pretty good. And we actually heard the judge say, not the judge, the lawyer from New York State say, what do they want to do, turn the doctrine of discovery upside down? <laughs> he said that, and yes, and uh, what has happened is in the courts, 
is they made new law just so they can shut us down. New law that only pertains to Native Americans. And um, we know this is unjust. And I have, I brought a banner and I'd like the women to bring it up. They have it or is it up? It's over here. <coughs> it's over there far. I can't read it over there. Could you bring it over? <laughs> and I think it's very important because it is already proven that New York State, what they did to us in getting our land was illegal. That's proven. Nobody even questions that. And this statement from Washington himself, founder of your country, you can go right in front of me. Um, this is one of the statements that he made uh, very close to the time of our Canandaigua Treaty. So he promised us that he would not allow states to defraud us. And, you know, and he had said this. So this is, this is where it's at. We have been defrauded, and we have been mistreated over time, and our peoples have had, you know, to go through a lot of recovery to get through some of it, and we're still recovering, and uh, we're going to still seek justice. So we're taking it to the um, Organization of American States for that purpose, and to keep it alive, because we know there are people in this room who care and it does matter to them, and we know there are people in America where it does matter how Native people are treated. So, thank you. Thank you very much. So, I thought I'd, I'd ask Joe to do his lawyer stuff. <laughs> well, uh, good evening everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, Actually, you did most of the legal stuff. Oh. <laughs> um, I think most of us know what happened in the, in the U.S. courts. We filed uh, just about nine years ago, and within three weeks, the, uh, as Frida mentioned, the Supreme Court changed Indian law and turned it on its head by making up a new defense that they could uh, protect New York State with. And so we, uh, we um, Got the, the case was dismissed out from under us with about, I think we had two hours of argument in the district court. That was our day in court. Uh, two years ago on Columbus Day, I got to get 10, on actually October 12th, 2012, Columbus Day, which is, I thought was perfect historic irony, given that all U.S. law, uh, Indian law, is built on the doctrine of discovery. And one of the things that we that really has that I've been educated about over the last uh, decade or so is that there, it's just absolutely impossible to find justice for Indian nations in the U.S. courts, and that's because all of this land is stolen. All of the land is taken illegally. If we think back to after the Revolutionary War, the uh, every one of the founding fathers was a land speculator. Washington stood on the shores of Oneida Lake and started thinking about the money that could be made by taking the land from the Indians and selling it. New York sold the land almost immediately, the land they took from uh, the Onondagas for five times as much as they paid for. So when you have that basis that all of the land is illegally taken, you have to keep denying that or else you have a serious problem. And so they make up excuses. And that's exactly what they've done to the Onondagas, the Oneidas, and the Cayugas. And so we suffered through the federal courts. And now we've filed in a, um, a commission that has found human rights violations repeatedly uh, that have been committed on indigenous nations. It's a much better set of rules to, to work under. Um, and the major uh, human rights violations that we've uh, brought to their attention are the illegal taking of the land to begin with. When you take indigenous people's lands, there's a, a tremendous uh, damage that's done to culture and language and health. And so that's one of the human rights. Then we talk about 
Um, we talk a great deal in this petition, as we did in the uh, complaint in the federal court, about the environment. We talk about the damage that's done to Onondaga Lake, Onondaga Creek. We talk about the attack of the frack and the big oil and big gas that wants to frack the Finger Lakes. We talk about the pipeline they tried to run last year between Binghamton and Syracuse, where Onondaga worked with their neighbors to stop that. And the same framework continues today. The Onondaga's message of healing to its neighbors so that we can all work together to protect the natural world so that we can pass a better world on to our children and grandchildren. And also there's a, there's a call to people to wake up about climate change because the earth is burning as we're sitting around fiddling. And we have the Koch brothers and all the big industries trying to make us uh, forget that. But we all know that that's really the cutting edge issue of our time. And Onondaga is very centrally involved in that struggle. And the other thing that strikes me as I try to learn from the last few years is the kind of Orwellian word games that the courts have played. So they say, essentially they've said to the state of New York, you don't have to worry about the treaties anymore because they're too old and because we think that raising these issues now will be disruptive of the settlers that took over the land. Disruptive. Well, I think we know who was really disrupted in the last 240 years, and it's the people whose land it was taken, and they were removed forcibly. We had Washington send his armies against Onondaga and Seneca and Cayuga villages in 1779 in what was clearly a war crime. And the result of that, and the resulting loss of the land and the culture and the health that has happened from stealing this land, that's the disruption. And they, they labeled this defense equity. Oh, excuse me. I've only been, this is my 40th year of practicing law. Uh, one of these years I'll get it right, I hope. But, uh, <laughs> equity, fairness, balancing of the harm between the parties. If they would apply equity with one-tenth of what it should be, the Onondagas would have the land back or have the rights to the land, the rights to be heard about what happens on the land, that would be returned. So we know it's not disruptive. And then they say, well, you really weren't using the land very well back then. You know it was all woods and uh, you just didn't know how to use it, which really is another principle that is the foundation of the doctrine of discovery, terra nullis, where Christians say, if we don't find any Christians on the land, we consider it empty and therefore the title is ours. The same principle applies here. They claim that the land that's been taken has been developed. I tried to talk to the Second Circuit about Onondaga Lake and how one would be very strained to call that development. But that's the kind of construct that they just make up, no facts whatsoever before any court that's made up all of these defenses. In Cheryl, I remember we were doing a historic series to prepare for the land rights and, and we studied the briefs very carefully that went up to the Supreme Court in Cheryl. Not one word about latches. They just made it up. It wasn't even argued. I guess it did come up a question or two during oral argument. So these cases, uh, eventually history will judge them the same way they judged Plessy versus Ferguson. And history will someday say this was an amazingly shameful period in United States history and the courts. Of course, the court keeps doing it worse things every day. I'm sure we all heard about the decision today. If you're a corporation, you have all the rights in the world. If you're an Indian nation, you have none. If you're a common person, you have very few. We all know that. And yet Onondaga will persevere. They will continue to talk about this. I've only been working with them about 30 years, and every, every week they work to get their land back 
and to have more of a say in what's going on, to make certain that we really get something that will clean up Onondaga Lake, not cover it up. So, the first paragraph that we all know so well from the, the land rights action in federal court that talks about healing is repeated as early as we could in this petition. And so the call for healing continues. The call for justice continues. And we appreciate everybody's help because working together it's really been a very invigorating nine years since the case was filed because of all the progress and all the cooperation. And we just have to keep doing it until we can force some justice out of the U.S. system. Thank you for listening. wanted to bring up that um, there is a conference on the Doctrine of Discovery at the Scanner Center on the 24th, I believe it is, May of May. It's, it's a Saturday. <clears throat> so if you wanted to have more understanding of how it affected our history, it'd be a good thing to go to. And I think it's something like a Doctrine of Discovery, what's next? I think. So in other words, there's flyers in the back for that. Um, so I wanted to mention that so you, you could have a choice of going to that. So Oren's here, and I think we can hand it over to him. One of our environmental warriors is what he is. Travels all over the world, helping people understand how important it is to take care of our environment. So we might all live into the future. And we really appreciate Orrin coming, yes. all of us do. Well, I haven't been asleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. I just took back a little piece of land myself, right outside the door here. I parked right in that open lane you had there. <laughs> <laughs> you discovered it. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, hey Noon, hi, how are you? And I um, appreciate your work and the, uh, well, the, the support you've been giving us. You know, every time we've had some of these um, contests, I don't know what else you call it, but uh, we're always over the years involved in one thing or another. And we've always had a group that would come up from our brothers yourselves. They always came up I and mean, they always got out there and they helped us fight and really appreciate that. Allies. So it's always there, you know. Um, the group down there from Binghamton, who remembers that name? Uh, Rain. 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 Rights for American Indians now, remember? They would go into places and they would argue for us because if we went in there, we'd just have a fight. <laughs> so, so it's it's a big um, support for us, and appreciate the fact that they're they're willing to come out here and stand up. There's always a always a few brave people. The uh, doctrine of discovery. We really didn't know about it for a long, long time. And it was, um, it was out there in one form or another, but those words that were being spoken at that time in the uh, 1840s or, we, we weren't aware of what was being spoken across, uh, maybe in courts or stuff. And, when we went to Geneva in 1977 to, uh, I would say, we went to Oz, we thought, we thought, oh boy, finally we're going to come to the wizard and we get to Oz and they will see what's wrong and they will straighten it right out and everybody heard about the United Nations and we heard about it and we knew a little bit about it. So, made our way over there 
And um, it was interesting, again, you know, because uh, this particular venture uh, from the Six Nations and 140, I think, other delegates from around North Central and South America, uh, also uh, the Samis from Sweden and Norway, they came, they came with us. and. Uh, so we arrived at the gates of Oz in, in Switzerland, and uh, we arrived with our passports, which we had to, you know, when we said, well, what's it going to take to get over? Well, I got to have a passport. Okay, somebody go find a passport and let's see what it looks like, you know. So we said, oh, yeah, well, we can make, we can make something like that. So we did. And uh, so we arrived with our passports, and. It was, um, it was a problem for the border, and so we, we had a good contingency of uh, Six Nation leaders, actually their chiefs and clan mothers, and uh, about 20, 26, 27 of us, I think. So there we were, sitting in the frontier, while they would be running about and they would come in and ask us a question then they would go again and it was about four hours. So we were patient to see what was going to happen because we thought if they didn't take our passport seriously then what, what, what was the point? What was the point of being there? So we test them right off the bat and then, and eventually uh, they said, well, we, we, we think we have a solution. I said, well, what is that? And they said, we're going to issue a, a document and we're going to put it in your passport and, and you don't lose that document because when you leave, you give it back to us. And so I said, all right, let us uh, talk to our, our contingency here. So we sat there and we discussed it. We said, well, they're not stamping our passport. Uh, however, we don't have any other document. So, is it a win or not? And the consensus was, yeah, we don't have another document and they're putting it in there. So it's a step, so let's take this step. So we did. And we went through and we got our, our tags and they said, don't lose that, and it goes, that's your identity. So anyway, <clears throat> when we got inside, of course we knew the history of uh, this Kahe, who was a Cayuga chief who had gone over to Geneva in 1927, and he was laying charges against uh, Canada. He was one of the chiefs from Canada, and um, Canada had forcibly removed the traditional council of chiefs with, uh, with uh, the Royal Mounted Police came in and forcibly removed them and installed a puppet government. And uh, so he was there. Uh, with the support of our, our leaders over here. And he wanted to address, at that time, the League of Nations. And Canada and England uh, stopped him from addressing. Um, and so, when he came back, and, it, and the uh, League of Nations, have ever, ever been to Geneva, anybody? It's right on the lake. It's, it's right almost downtown. And uh, so he walked back, and, um, and then he was invited um, when the mayor of, of Geneva heard that he, he couldn't be, he couldn't preach the uh, League of Nations. The mayor of Geneva said, well, I'll, um, 
I'm going to hire the biggest hall we have here, and I'm going to sponsor your meeting, and we will. You can talk to to us and the people. And that's what happened. And they said the night that he was going to speak to them, that it was packed, crowded, people outside couldn't get in. It was a huge <coughs> event for, for Geneva. And so he had, you know, people to talk to, and so he explained his mission. And when he was finished, he was tired. Uh, one thing that you will see with leaders and chiefs, and I see our young leader here picking up the same habit, you start carrying a bag with papers in it. <laughs> and that bag gets bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier. And that's what this guy was carrying. He's carrying this bag of documents and papers, talking about just exactly what was being discussed here. You know, the legality of it and the documents, which didn't seem to, to mean anything. Anyway, as he was leaving, a um, little boy yanked on his pant leg and he stopped and the boy wanted to just shake hands. So he stopped and he put his bag of papers down and kind of chat with the boy for a little bit. You know. And then he picked up his bag and went on his way. So here we were now, 1923, and now we're here it was in 1977, and kind of in the same situation. Um, but we were invited by the international NGOs to address the issues of um, discrimination. And we did have, you know, the halls of, of the UN. So we were preparing. Uh, we had to meet with our compatriots from North Central South America and Canada uh, to discuss who was going to be the speakers, uh, what was the agenda, and we had arrived on Friday, and here it was Saturday, we're going to one day, Sunday to meet, and Monday we're going to address the United Nations. So we didn't have much time. And, uh, but we got together and we had a meeting and because of the similarity of our uh, ways, uh, there was really not a big problem of uh, choosing the leaders and choosing the speakers. It went pretty good, it went pretty fast. And um, <coughs> the subject we all agreed upon, and uh, we had speakers from the Lakotas, we, we assigned duties and, and um, we had speakers from Central America and South America and uh, some very, very astute and very good leaders who are there. Um, so anyway, um, we were assigned, the, the Six Nation was um, in the process of this whole idea of going to Geneva, uh, we were approached by um, the Lakota Nation and uh, many of the people who were organizing this, and they said because uh, the Six Nation had such a long history of involvement, internationally and nationally, uh, would we would we take the lead? And so we had spent, uh, in preparation, at least three years of meetings in, across America, in uh, Indian country. So we had ourselves together, but we didn't know the people from Sami land, or we didn't know the people from Central America, South America. But within, I would say, 
three hours we had the speakers, we had the agenda, and uh, we were just refining the discussion. And it was because we have the same understanding of, of, uh, of law, or what you call, um, it's not religion, it's a way of life. And, uh, we understood it. We, we didn't have to, you know, there was translations that would have to go to three or four times, you know. Some coming down from the mountains and then that translated to somebody and then that gets to Spanish and then finally gets to English. Because we were uh, so diverse in the places that we come from. But our background and our understanding was essentially the same. So the spiritual side of things, from the tobacco burnings and the prayers that were made and so forth, uh, we didn't have to understand the words that were being spoken because we knew what was being said. It was always the same. So one of our elders, no matter who they were, could speak for everybody there. And uh, so we began, and it was given to the Six Nation to be the first opening speaker after the pipe. Now they have protocols. They have a lot of protocols, and I think we broke every one of them. <laughs> first of all, you're not supposed to bring religion. They call it religion. We said, that's a religion. We said, that's a way of life, and we got to have a pipe. That's got to start the whole business. And, and they were just as curious about us as we were about them, because this was a really interesting time, and we had brought our, our best outfits and our feathers and our outfits and all the varieties of colors, quite a group. <laughs> and the AIM boys were singing a song with a big drum coming in. It was very uh, impressive. Everybody was looking, it was, we were looking at them and they were looking at us, you know. And uh, we had been given a, a short time, and you know, for Indians, like, just like now, I'm taking a lot of time. I just don't have an idea of a short time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just organizing ourselves, and you, you know, you from, you know, Panama speaking, uh, Ecuador speaking, Peru, you know. Uh, but we did it. And, uh, and in the preparation, it's interesting, and you should know, when we said, well, okay, now maybe this is going to be the first and last time that we're going to be able to speak. So if this is the first and last time, then what is it that's the most important thing to say? And so we had really, you know, a discussion because we had, well, we heard of treaties, you had um, histories, you had. And then we said, well, for us, Six Nations, we said, you know, if we have only one chance to speak, then we're going to have to speak for those that can't speak. And so we said, we're going to speak on behalf of all the animals in the world. We're going to speak on behalf of the water and the earth. That will be our, our opening statement and our only statement. And then you boys pick it up from there. <laughs> and uh, that's how we opened. That we see no seat for the eagle here. You know, where, where are the animals? Where are they? And so it was a good combination. And uh, <clears throat> the, there was a lot that I can't go into, it's a detail, some really interesting stuff. You know, like one of our Indian people sitting at the USA desk 
was a flag flying in front of me. We wondering, well, what's he doing over there? <laughs> uh, but a lot of stuff like that. But anyway, directly after we arrived, uh, a runner came up and said, the mayor has invited you, and he said, came to the Haudenosaunee, and he said, the Haudenosaunee leaders, the mayor has invited you, and he was using our proper name. I said, Haudenosaunee, he said, you and Haudenosaunee are invited, and you and all of your Indian friends to come to a reception at the mayor's garden, the mayor's office. That was really good news to us. So we informed everybody, put on your best clothes, tomorrow we're going to have a reception. And it was a reception, it was quite a reception. I mean, they had, they know how to do this stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they had drummers all dressed in their, their outfits that had to be from the 14th century. And those drums rattled like machine guns. I mean, they were loud and they knew how to do it, you know. And then they had the mayor and he was all, he had a great bandolier around his chest across here and he had a great big, I don't know what it was, but it looked like diamonds and gold and everything. Mm -hmm. Very, very formidable. He's not a big man, about my size. And uh, <clears throat> so when we arrived there, we saw how the formality was. They had a beautiful garden, and there was, a, there was a, the tables were set with linen and crystal, and a great amount of food. It was real reception. So it made us feel good. So prior to this, too, because Discahe was the first one to go over there, in our discussions amongst ourselves, we said, you know, and this guy at the time was uh, Harvey Longboat. And Harvey was carrying that title from uh, Six Nations. And he couldn't make it. He couldn't go working or something. So we said, you know, somebody might ask. So what do we do if somebody asks? Harvey said, I'll, I'll write a note. So he wrote a statement. And then we said, well, we, we should kind of honor the whoever it is if they do. So how we do that? So we made a gestoa, our headdress, just for the first person, the first person, no matter who, was going to say, this guy, he was going to get that <laughs> gestoa. <laughs> and we said, well, now if we make that a full size, and they're going to put it on their head and they're going to walk away with it. So let's make it just a little too small. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really walk away with it. So we did. You can't tell with a good story with a lot of feathers on. <laughs> so that's what we have. And the mayor steps forward, and his first words were, Is this guy here? Yeah. That was his first words. Is this guy here? Oh, bingo. <laughs> and everything he's going to get, you know. So, <clears throat> he welcomed us and he wished us good luck and he says, I want to talk to you tomorrow. There's a lot you have to know about this city-state. He said, this is a, a state. He said, there are so many different nations here. He says, there's intrigues, there's everything and you should know. But then he went on and he told that story that I just told you about this guy. And he said, I was that little boy. He says, and that man stopped and talked to me. He said, this is my first chance to pay back. And he says, and you guys will never have a problem coming into Geneva. Never. So, it was kind of a lesson to all of us, you know, a little kindness here and there. Goes a long way. Certainly went a long way for us, and we were prepared. 
And of course, the rest of the time we were there, he spent trying to put the hat on. <laughs> <laughs> he would try to put it on, he'd set it down, and pretty soon he's backed out trying to. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, um, and that was just a couple of years ago. I think two years back now, I'm not sure, I lose track of time, but we were invited again by the mayor all of the Indian people, and now it wasn't uh, 140 or 2,000 indigenous people in Geneva a couple of years ago, and we had a reunion at the mayor's office. We had the same thing, we had a great, huge reception. Uh, and so it's a tradition in Geneva, Switzerland, for the Indian nations to be welcomed and to be there. And just to give you a little heads up, uh, our Iroquois Nationals across under 19 men's team was playing in the last world tournament in Finland. And, uh, and they defeated the USA <laughs> by two goals <laughs> in file style. That was a couple of Thompson boys were there. <laughs> And, uh, and so on the way back across the field, the, uh, the head of the English lacrosse program caught up to our general manager and said to him as he walked across the field, he says, you know, we're, we're trying hard to get the, this sport into the Olympics. And he says, and, and we're close to it, I think we're going to do it. And he says, and the Iroquois are not eligible to play. Now this is an English manager telling our general manager as he walks across the field, just after beating the USA. So if it isn't one thing, it's another. <laughs> The other day we were just talking with the Nike people who are give our, our uniforms and keep us sharp out there. I have to mention that to him. He turned around and says, oh, really? <laughs> he says, Nike's a big dog there in the Olympics. He says, yeah. So we'll see. But let's just give you a heads up, what's the next one? So we're going to be playing in in uh, Denver on uh, the 9th of uh, July to the 19th. The World Men's Outdoor Games are going to be there and we'll have a good team and uh, it'll be a good contest. And um, we'll be preparing to host the World's Indoor Box Lacrosse Championship here in Syracuse. At Onondaga Nation, uh, 2015. So we're going to need all you guys to be out there, and, and we expect at least 16 countries to be here. The indoor box game is not as well played as, as the outdoor game is, so there's fewer nations. But right now, I think the count of uh, of the countries that are playing lacrosse right now is 143. And when we joined uh, the Federation of International Lacrosse in 19, um, was it 86, 86, 87, 1987, there was just four teams playing. Australia, Canada, England, and the USA, and we were the fifth one. So from that time to now, there's 143 countries have picked up the stick, and uh, China and Russia will have teams in these Denver games. So it's going to get good and hot out there. <laughs> but getting back, you know, to Geneva. And this doctrine of discovery 
when we we got there and we, we, we had a good week and we came back, I mean, uh, <clears throat> the, the USA was trying to, the, the uh, consulate was, was trying to meet with us and the uh, Indian fellow that was, that was sitting behind that desk was their runner and he kept asking if we'd go and meet with the consulate. He kept ignoring him. And on the last day, as they were closing, the, uh, uh, he came up to me. It was, I think it was uh, Corbett, Corbett Sundown was burning tobacco, closing. And uh, he, he whispered in my ear, he says, can you guys come over and see the consulate? And I said to him, I said, you know, the consulate has stationary and when they invite somebody they write it on a note and it's sent by courier and it's handed and he disappeared and a while later he came back with an invitation from the US State Department to the Haudenosaunee using our proper name to come and meet at the U.S. consulate. That's a document of all the time that we went over and the things that we were doing. That's a document of recognition. And so we went. And uh, of course, of course, in the evening they were just dying to look at our passport. So I said, "Oh, by the way," I said. He said, "You guys are leaving tomorrow." I said, "Yep." Yeah. Any problems? He said, mm, I don't think so. I said, uh, I said yeah, we're we'll using our passport. I said, you want to see our passport? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Show your passport. And so we had our, our lawyers ready in New York City when we arrived. We figured, oh, we might have a battle here. And um, when we were lining up to, well, you come in and it says U.S. citizens here, and it says uh, other. We went to other, because we're not U.S. citizens. We're citizens of the Onondaga Nation, Cayuga Nation, Seneca Nation. So we were standing in the other line, and they came over and they said, you guys, you got to come over here. And I said, we, we're going to put you over here and you can go through. So we all lined up and no time at all. We were standing outside looking for a cat, and they had our baggage and everything. So everything was ready for us. We just there we were. The lawyers there. There was no fight, no, no nothing. But that's not over, as you know. So, in the doctrine of discovery, in the course of time that we were there. For, 1977 to when they finally passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, 2007, 30 years later, they finally recognized us as peoples in that document. But during the course of that time, <clears throat> I wondered why if the United Nations said that uh, everybody had human rights and we didn't have human rights. There was no human rights for us. And I wondered why. Why is it that we have to write our own statement on rights? Why is it that we just can't be accepted in the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights? And that's when we began to understand about the doctrine of discovery. We heard word from Peru and they were doing the footwork down there. And they said, aha, this is in uh, 89, 1989. Uh, they told us that they were finding documents. And then in 1991, a young man by the name of Steve Newcomb showed up at our traditional circle of elders and meeting up there in the state of Washington. 
he says, I got this stuff you guys got to see. He was this young guy, and he was so excited. He said, okay, calm down. Get something to eat, give a rest, we'll talk to you tomorrow. So the next day, he stopped producing these documents. And he wasn't, he didn't go, he was not a university person. He was kind of self-taught. And that was really surprising. So we took that document and we, <clears throat> I said, There's, this is a reason. And it was an exclusionary document. Basically, it was a, a papal bull. But I'm not certain of which pope it was what number he was, but it was 1493, one year after the so-called discovery, and the papal bull said, and I'll just paraphrase, if there are no Christian nations in this new land that you have discovered, I declare those lands to be empty. Terra nullius, the whole Roman law, very old law that operated all the way around the world. Further, if these, if there are people and they are not Christians, they do not have a right of title to the land. They have only the right of occupancy. One year after the discovery, by declaration, by fiat, by statement, and next, the whole Western Hemisphere. And of course, we were over here planting corn, we had no idea that that was said. But that was behind all of that. And so the King of England, who had split away from Rome, in 1496, said to the Capets, he gave them the same uh, instruction, almost precisely the same instruction. Now this was for England, and a contest between Catholics and Protestants, as you know, is pretty brisk today. Still there, still pretty strong. So that was the basis of that, and I think that <clears throat> It's going to be the support of these uh, Christian religions in support of, of following that doctrine of discovery. And we've got, I see my friend back there, he's, uh, he's made statements before. And uh, there's, uh, there's support from uh, coming from the Methodists and, Quite a few now have stood up and, and declared that. And also, the, uh, uni the United Nations, uh, <coughs> uh, what do they call them, the Christian churches, anyway. I have a seat. And they made a declaration denouncing the doctrine of discovery. So that's where the power is going to come from, and that's where the challenge is going to be, and that's where you can help because that's the field that they can't deal with, the public. And the public is understanding the injustice of the whole thing. And so that organization is the next step. Because the churches are powerful, as you know, and they've almost all lined up against the Vatican. The Vatican is tough too, as you know. And so, uh, that's where the contest is going to be next. <coughs> and that's where our support is coming from. It's more organized. And we'll see whether we can get that uh, better shaped up for what's going to happen at the UN in these next few weeks, where we're a permanent forum in indigenous issues is going to be um, the event for the next two weeks, starting on the 12th to the 23rd. So we'll be there, uh, and we've been there for a long time. We're very familiar with that crown. Uh, but the, the opposition remains the same. And uh, 
when the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People was finally presented, uh, we had 147 uh, nations accepting the Declaration. We had 11 abstentions, including Russia, including France. Uh, and we had four countries that voted against it. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the USA voted against the doctrine of discovery. And it was a huge revelation to the general public to see that. And finally able to see what we were fighting all these years. And they haven't gone away. So it's still there. So that's a long story, but it gives you uh, some idea. We voted against hundred. We voted against the indigenous rights. You, you said the documents. It was uh, the Declaration of Rights that, that they voted against for indigenous people. And you just happened to say uh, doctrine of discovery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Words just keep coming. So. I've done that many times myself. That's the wrong thing. Thank you, Orange.